Robin Thicke and its bloodlines on Radio Borders, 23 minutes away from midday. Ian Gillespie, the Radio Borders vet from the Merlin Veterinary Group, is with us this morning. Good morning, Ian. Nice to see you again. Morning, Stuart. It's, yes. on, it's not been that long. It's only a week. We were, yeah. yeah. You're doing a good holiday? Y- yes, it needed. Well needed. So it was g- good just to take a step back. Good but man. here we are, back, back at the thick of it. And, of course, the rugby season upon us as well. Fantastic. What's been happening with yourself, Is he? Yes, busy enough. Yeah, um, right. yeah definitely. Oh, right. Okay, you'll end of that conversation. <laughs> Sorry, <yeah. laughs> right. Uh, any questions you want to put in, get in touch. You know the drill on text. You can call us up on the studio line. You can also email Stuart at radioborders.com. Now, we're going straight on to the um, Facebook page. Somebody got in touch via Facebook, and it's uh, Kathy. Now, this is regarding cats, as I just uh, line it up here now. Now, it's going to obviously tie in quite nicely because we've got a guest in with us uh, this morning as well. But uh, can you ask Ian's advice on how to catch my cat? Now, this is dead dead serious. It's never been home for over four months. It's been going in another cat flap a distance away, uh, eating the cat's food. I've been down many times to try and uh, entice it with food, but no luck. It just makes out he doesn't know me, and uh, he's not been neutered. In fact, it was after I took him to the vet to get checked and booked in that he actually took off. Now, there's also a big brood of a black cat that may have scared him off. Now, I've got two cats as kittens, both male, uh, just under a year. They're just a year old, and I'm thinking of setting a squirrel trap what do you think definitely not a squirrel trap is far far too small uh i mean you've got you've got a variety of problems here is the fact that he's he's not come home for four months he's almost rehomed himself unfortunately the fact he's uncastrated that makes it uh, create, creates a difficulty and yes okay he might have got a fright with a visit to the vet but it's more likely the black cat that, it, that he's encountered yeah. uh that they've had a tussle and he's staying away um, but certainly not a squirrel trap. I mean, as you mentioned, we've got a guest, and it's it's it's, it's along these lines. What we should be using is is, is a cat trap uh, rather than a squirrel trap. Squirrel traps far too small and will mm. do them damage. Um, this morning, who we have is a, 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 a young gentleman called Kevin Newell, who's the only non-lethal pest control organisation in Britain. And uh, welcome, welcome. Hi. And you. it's good to have him along. So he might like to enlarge on this question uh, as well but uh, I believe Kevin that you started your business after some th- 30 cats went missing and 20, 28 were actually killed That's correct. in Harwich and Essex. Yeah um, it was one of my, my good friends in Harwich has seen it on social media that they created a page because so many cats were disappearing or, or collapsing in, in you know in people's homes and uh, I collected all the information and using you know my my knowledge of of how cats behave um and working with um one of the the per- people who had lost their cats and the local police down there you know understanding how they work where they go their territories whether they're neutered uh, male or female i was able to to help them pinpoint uh, you know one of three houses where you know we thought this person who was committing the crimes came from and lo and behold we did actually locate the person who was committing the crimes, but unfortunately the police didn't have enough evidence to prosecute. So you're better of like Ace Ventura Peck detective than Kevin. I mean, how did you get involved there with it? I mean, what got you started? What got you involved in, in what, doing your job? Doing what I do yeah, now? Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've always uh, loved animals. I worked as a teenager after leaving college for a year in an animal rescue centre. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'd work from 7 to 11 at night and sometimes wouldn't even go home. I'd be there all the time. So, you know, I, I, got, I got to grow and understand animals, not just um, wild animals, you know, your cows, sheep, horses, cats, dogs as well. So it kind of grew from there. And I've never really stopped it. I've, I've done all sorts of I kind of work throughout the years since then, uh, be it um, watching over birds of prey's nest, helping with badger watching, watching their sets, it, it, covering a whole range of different animals I've, well, I've helped with. I was going to say, I mean, I thought it was just purely cats, but it's a whole range of animals. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Um, you name it, um, I will not, I will not turn, um, turn someone away. If they yeah. need help regarding, you know, it could be deer, um, mole, bat, bird, cat, fox, yeah. you name it, I will, I will do my best to, to help them overcome their problems. So what kind of unusual animals, and what's been your, your weirdest experience to date then? You... What, with the business? Yeah. Um, we actually helped done some consultation work with the SSPCA in mm. South Africa, right. helping them develop a um, humane way so they could uh, send some paperwork to the government to try and rewrite legislation there with animal welfare. And that mm. involved 
um, looking at and trying to find humane deterrence for the baboons in the Cape. They've got a big problem there. And also jackals for the farmers. You know, they lose a lot of sheep and lambs over there to the jackal population. Mm -hmm. So just trying to help them you know, come up with new ideas and, and helping them work their way forward over there so they don't have to go to the culling of the animals. Yeah, I was going to say, because that would be the obvious answer, just to cull these animals, but you're trying to do it in a humane way, yep. you know, a far better way, far better solution. In, in my mind, culling only, you know, that's just treating the problem, well, it's just treating the symptoms of the problem. I go and solve the problem. I look at the bigger picture. Culling is the quick and easy option when it's not even a very popular option in most cases, mm -hmm. but we look at how you can actually solve the whole problem, not not just see what's on top, shoot, and, and yes, the numbers will go, but you're still not dealt with the problem, why the numbers are increasing and why they're causing the problems they are. Right, sorry, you now stepped on your toes there. You may continue, you know, just yeah, to get out of chat there. So. No, I you, I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated. Go, go on. I mean, one of the things that, that Kevin and I were sitting talking about, and it was, it, as always, in one of my books, Vet Record this, this week, and we're talking about the very fact, feral pigeon control, and uh, what came up was there was a city in, in Europe that um, actually tried, burn, burn yeah, tri tried to shoot, shoot them out. So as a result, the, 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 um, as Kevin will explain, uh, there was a, a population explosion rather than actual fact less pigeons when they tried to shoot them. Yeah, um, well, in this case in Switzerland, people love the pigeons over there in Bern and they were feeding them all the time. So as you can imagine, pigeons being the only bird which can produce their own milk from whatever food they eat so they can effectively breed all, all year round so there's there's no stopping them you know mm -hmm. increasing their numbers mm -hmm. so they were shooting them um in burn and the numbers actually increased because the survival of the fittest you know they were breeding more and they continued to breed so it had no effect um a pigeon expert over there came up with a, a really great idea which is something we need to think about in this country as well where instead of trying to shoot them, they managed the pigeons. And they've done this by setting up feeding areas in the local park there, away from all the buildings and everybody else, uh -huh. so that people could still continue to feed the pigeons. Yeah. They had to go to these uh, places and they had the pigeon lofts as well. So then they contained all the fouling, so they took one big problem off the city, so the birds went fouled on, on the paths and in your monuments. Or on your washing line. And even on your washing line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then um, what they did, so they had a smaller area to clear, and then also they can manage the population number because they had the pigeon lofts. They could go along every day, and if there's eggs, remove the eggs. And, you know, it saved the council over there so much money. And, you know, it was a, a really good PR cue for them. Everyone loved the idea. They got to feed the pigeons. Everyone was a winner. And the population fell about 60%. It's an incre incredible business venture for you, though, Kevin. You know, I mean, what made you think, you know, well, I could be the only person in Britain doing this, which you are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and you, obviously your work takes you, you know, not just within the UK. You go yeah. uh, far and far and wide. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And obviously people know about your business. Um, yeah, I mean, we've begun since January. Um, and we are slowly building up um, you know, the profile of the, of, of the business. Mm. Um, you know, it's just my love for wildlife. You know, everyone talk to anyone who knows me. I'm so enthusiastic about what I do. And just it's not just about going there and helping them, but I love to educate people about why the problem's there and about the animal. And, and in many cases, I've, I've had people who had fox cubs in their garden, quite and right have it. Mm -hmm. And when they got to understand about the foxes and why they're there in their lives, they actually didn't want them to go. They actually, you know, I, I just came to a point where they thought, you know, actually, no, we can put up with them for a couple more months before mm. they leave. They actually learned to enjoy what they were watching. No, I used to have a hedgehog who used to come around the front door and I used to feed it digestive biscuits because it loved them. Um, is that bad for it? Or? Yeah, I wouldn't feed them. I mean, ah, people right. put out the meal cow and, and other things like that. If you're going to feed hedgehogs, you mm. know, cat dog food is usually quite good for them. Right. Um, they love it, they'll eat it. And, and, you know, I've got a little hedgehog with some that comes myself and my gunner comes by every night. Right. Um, but digestives, no. I mean, if, if you're going to. If you want to help and support them, you know, try and keep the food as natural as possible. Mealworms, you know, mm. something like they're more eat naturally than our food. It's good. We love digestives. Yeah. Hedgehogs, you know, their 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 bodies are not really used to eating digestives. Well, it's quite unusual for me because I don't share food usually, so that you know <laughs> that, that's a one-off. But just going back to the question, then Kevin, obviously from Kathy that's got in touch with us here regarding the cat that's gone and she's looking perhaps to get it back uh, by setting a squirrel trap. I mean, I'll, I'll let you deal with that. Um, what, yeah, what's your thoughts? Um, exactly what Ian said. He, he got it spot on. That's exactly what I would suggest too. The squirrel trap, you know, it's too small. It's designed for a squirrel, not a cat. There's a big size difference there a cat trap you know if they've got a problem they can either contact myself or the cats protection league they're they're really good i've, I've done some work with them who want to get a cat trap i mean the, the cat could even be like being said at the stage where if this big cat has scared it in it could have overtaken its territory and the cat now feels more safer down you know at the other house where it seems to have established its own 
um, territory uh, and, you know, it's happy there. It's not being harassed by the other cat and it's getting fed. So, you know, in its, in its mind, why do I need to go back? Yeah, but obviously from an owner's point of view, Ian Gillespie, the fact is, that, you know, she, she'll want her cat back. Yes, but but I, I think Kevin's quite right. It yeah. might have gone for That's good. It. Roman um, rules yeah, and all well, that yeah, kind of thing. Well, the the other thing, of course, Ian Gillespie needs castration because this cat needs castrated as well, yeah, uh, yeah. and that that that's an important fact. So we've got. No wonder it doesn't want to go home <laughs> and think no chance. I'm staying where I'm staying where I am. Well, you've got. I mean. Borders animal welfare and, and after she'll also catch cats in, in these circumstances as well because you can catch them humanely just with proper cat traps and then she would have the problem to deal with is how to keep the cat. She would have to take it home, keep it indoors, not let it out for three weeks. Being an unneutered cat, that would be very, very smelly. Uh, so there are these complications to be considered, but yeah, there are ways around it. OK, well, there'll be more from Ian and Kevin. Right, right our guest today has been Kevin. Uh, just quickly uh, go over what Kevin does for us, Ian, and I'll have you have the final word. Well, we, we talked about, again, I'll repeat it, only non-lethal pest control organisation in Britain. If you want to find him, you can find him on Facebook or Twitter, and he has his own website, www.humanewildlifesolutions.co.uk. And Kevin, you're doing you're doing well. You're now coming on with a, a possible wash deterrent as well. Yeah, um, we I say we as myself has um, been working over the summer on trying to find. I've had a lot of calls about wasps and wasp nests, and because you know non-lethal, I will never move away from that side. That's what makes us unique. So I've been researching to wasps, learning about them, and, and I think I believe we'll come up with a product which is all plant-based, which will, if you have a wasp nest, deter that wasp nest. So this, this product you will spray, um, you know, we're doing the trials, we'll spray onto the nest, and, you know, by going with what I've, I've researched, the wasps hopefully will up and leave that nest, and there's no use for, you know, the, the, the poisons or anything like that you need to use. So it's a safe way for you to use. And if it's in your house or your garden, you ain't got to worry because it's plant-based. There's no harm to you, your pets, your family. And, you know, if the trials do work and prove that this does work, it will be a first of its kind in the UK, maybe even Europe. So, you know... Yeah as an exclusive there for you. Yeah, fantastic. No doubt, I think we'll get you back in, I think, uh, maybe 12 months from now, Kevin, see how things going. And good luck uh, with Colchester United and uh, as well, because I know you're a big fan. <laughs> yeah, we need it, I tell you. <laughs> yes. uh, right, that's uh, Kevin there. Ian, of course, uh, final words uh, from yourself. Just final words is Kevin obviously is looking for work, so if there are either residential or commercial properties that have got a pest problem, please get in touch. We've told you how to get in touch. They've, he actually won an award from PETA, the, the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, mm -hmm. Uh, which is great, and the best of luck to Kevin. Yeah, Thank thanks, you much. Yeah, th yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. And Ian Gillespie, the Radio Bonders vet from the Maryland Veterinary Group, back in next Tuesday morning at half past 11.